Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, welcome to the Malay Heritage Centre uh, for those of you here and um, welcome to another session of our public lecture series for our audience uh, tuning in at home. Um, today's session is slightly different. Uh, today is uh, going to be a hybrid lecture slash workshop. Uh, so uh, those of you who are watching at home, you won't be able to see this, but our audience in the auditorium are broken up into four groups. Uh, so they'll be having some uh, appreciation of uh, some of the gemstones that will be shared uh, by our speaker today, Mr. Tae Kun Ming. So today's lecture, uh, appreciating, appreciating the Gemstones of the World uh, by Tae Kun Ming. Uh, this uh, talk slash workshop is organized in conjunction with our speci ongoing special exhibition, Orang Banja, Heritage and Culture of the Banja in Singapore, uh, which was opened in no late November and will run all the way until 25th July 2021. Um, this is part of our Sir Nusantara series where we bring um, different cultural groups uh, that make up the Malay uh, community in Singapore such as the Bawianis, the Minangkabaos, the Javanese, the Bugis and uh, right now the, the Banja from South Kalimantan. Uh, this talk is also in partnership with uh, the Jam Museum which Mr. Te Kun Ming is the founder of. Uh, this is the second session that we are collaborating with them. The first one was conducted on the 5th of December with uh, your father, right? Yeah, my uh, father. Your dad, uh, Mr. Te Tyson, uh, where he uncovered, uh, we shared some information on the diamonds and gem mining in Kalimantan. Okay, so for today, uh, appreciating gemstones of the world, um, thought that would start you on a journey of discovering gemstones with a deeper understanding while also enjoying their beauty. Uh, science and wonder. Find answers to questions like, what is a gem? Uh, I think you're a gem, I'm a gem. Yeah, you're a gem too. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what is a gem? Why are they valuable? Uh, what gemstones are available in the market? Uh, facilitated by Mr. Te Kun Ming, who is a certified gemologist and the founder of the Gem Museum. Uh, he experienced his perspectives on gemstones, um, hear real life stories from his travels, uh, from around the world, from the mines to the markets. Actually, in our conversation, uh, Kunming asked me what is it that uh, I want to tease out as part of this session uh, yeah. because you know, he has been to so many places and worked in uh, so many different parts of uh, gem uh, production, sales, and so yeah. on, uh, and now running a museum. Um, he's got a lot of information he could share, so we need to narrow things down. Yeah, right? yeah, so, yeah. so I sort of asked him, are there gemstones that are... Uh, sort of appreciated, more culturally specific, yeah. for example, uh, like say jade in Chinese culture. We all have heard how jade is very, well, very much appreciated in Chinese culture, for example. Um, what other gemstones are appreciated by different cultures throughout the world? Uh, do they differ? Do they have certain cultural significance uh, that is uh, put onto the gemstone right. itself, right? So I think today we'll, un we'll tease out some of these uh, ideas. Uh, you would also have an opportunity to see actual gemstones. Uh, you are all split according to tables. Uh, right now, there's nothing on it except for a lamp and disinfectant. But later, the second part of the lecture, we will give you gemstones to look at, right? Uh, so try not to steal them. They are actual gemstones. Uh, yeah, I will have a bouncer at the door when you leave <laughs> later. Right. Okay, a bit about Mr. Te Kun Ming. Um, he's the founder of Gem Museum and director of Far East Gem Institute. Far East Gems and Jewelry, and Far East Gem Import. Uh, as a certified gemologist, diamond trader, and gem dealer, Mr. Tay has traveled widely to various parts of Asia Pacific, such as Australia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand, China, and Hong Kong for gem sourcing trips and to participate in trade fairs. Uh, he's a West, uh, well respected in the trade. Kunming is a community member in the Diamond Exchange of Singapore and also an executive committee member of the Jewelers Association of Singapore, actively championing initiatives and efforts to raise the profile of the industry. Okay, before we start some housekeeping rules, um, we are still uh, restricted uh, by you know, uh, COVID-19 right now. So um, while we do want your interactivity, your questions, your answers, sadly, we cannot pass you microphones because then we have to disinfect them, put it aside for half an hour, and then go to the next question, which we don't have the luxury of doing. So this uh, QR code, uh, if you have any questions, you have any comments whatsoever, scan this QR code and then submit your questions. At the end of the session, we will hopefully go through them and uh, respond to them accordingly. Right? Um, we will also have 
uh, Kunming will give a talk for about one hour, and then the next half an hour we'll do the breakout sessions and appreciation. Uh, you, you will get to a chance to appreciate these gemstones, and finally we'll have a Q&A and feedback session at the end. All right? Okay. So without further ado, I will pass you on to Mr. Te Kun Ming. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Jamal. Thank you for Malay Heritage Center for invitation to uh, give out this talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming here. And those of you who are at home, thank you for tuning in. Uh, like and share and let everybody know about this uh, broadcast because it's going to be very, very interesting. So a little bit about me. This is what I do. And just now, Jamal has actually shared. Uh, I realize I travel a lot of the world. And I have seen that I deal a lot with uh, people who deal with gemstones. Yes, that's right. Gem, uh, Jamal, you say people are the gem. Yes, you are right. This is the key thing. All of us are really gems, especially in Singapore. We don't have a mine, and, uh, but the people are the gems. And uh, something is quite amazing. Later, we will talk a little bit about it, about how gems and people relate together. And what, what are some things that actually can actually correlate together. Uh, before I go in, I want to show you a video. And uh, in this uh, topic, we're going to talk about uh, arts, science, and culture. As, as, of course, appreciating gemstones, but really, how, how does the gemstones, the art and science of gemstones, influence culture? And I'll let you watch a video here, and just get a feel, what, what, what did you feel? So those of you who have a handphone right now, maybe you would like to scan this uh, code and go into this uh, Slido. And uh, you can participate because we would like this whole thing to be not just be a talk, but to be a two-way kind of a conversation. And uh, just uh, type in your answers and it will actually pop up on the screen. So I also scan that. Uh. Yeah, and those of you who are at home live, you also can scan this QR code and uh, participate as if you are here. So exciting. Now with the wonders of technology. So, oh, somebody say happy, death, very dear, sparkling. Oh, uh, thanks. Oh, expensive. <laughs> oh, bling, fancy, very fancy. Somehow or other, my, my one is not working. So mine is slow. So never mind. I have quite a few numbers there. So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the skull. The skull is actually, uh, he's, a, he's an artist. And uh, one of his good friends actually passed away. And, in, and he wants to commemorate his friend because gemstones, they last for forever. And they put it onto the skull. So initially, when I actually look at it, I was also taken aback because, I mean, I, I'm a Christian. So when I look at skull, I thought, wow, death, uh, very dark, uh, very like occulting. Uh. But then he said this. He said, behind every skull is a human being. And this is where the skull is left over and it actually brings him to remembrance about his friend. And putting gemstones on it brings up a lot of feelings because gemstones evoke a lot of emotions. And uh, he also wanted to put it as a lasting forever because gems really do, they do not decay and they last forever. Wow, let's look at it. Gorgeous, powerful, shiny, awesome. Wow, thank you very much. Those of you are here and also online, thank you for participating. You are so awesome. <laughs> Breathtaking, happy, bling. So uh, you can see it creates a lot of feelings. And the words that you can see here creates a lot of emotions. So brings me to the next point. How does the art and science of gemstones influence culture? All right, this is the main idea I want to leave behind with everybody here. How does art and science of gemstones influence culture? Because gemstones of the world, 
you know, it, it really occurs all over the world. And yeah, Singapore, we don't really have a gemstone mine. Maybe in between Dunan Road and Bukit Timah Road, there is actually a canal there. All right, this canal actually links all the way to Myanmar. And it's actually called the Ruby and Sapphire Belt. So those of you, nothing to do, but cannot, lah, because the government very smart. They built a canal on it, put cement already. So uh, you, if you actually go there and dig, ah, it's vandalism. So cannot. Lah, huh? All right. Okay, but anyway, the gemstones uh, in Singapore don't have, but gemstones really occur all over the world. And uh, one of it is the cat's eye. So you look at the cat's eye. Uh, this is my cat. I have a cat at home. And uh, you can see the eye is sharp. All right, and then on the stone, you also can see a cat's eye. So in gemstones, people of old are very figurative. They, they kind of blend it together with everyday objects like cat's eye, you know, and one of the people that like this kind of stones, uh, please, if you all have anything also later, you can text it in the Q&A. But uh, from my years of being in the trade, uh, many Japanese people like cat's eye and also Indonesian. Indonesian, they like uh, phenomenal gemstones. So this is something that uh, they will actually acquire and they will really like when I... I have a 34 carat one here. Later, I will show you. Very beautiful. Uh, the next one is also called a star ruby. All right, star ruby, you can see a star. And uh, on the stone itself, there's a star. All right, this is a two and a half carat uh, stone. I, I, it's in my safe somewhere. Uh, and you can see the star is red. And this is from Myanmar. So these are called phenomenal gemstones. And uh, people, like, people who like this are people like from Burma. You know, the Burmese, they really pride themselves in ruby. So one of my friends, his name is Goheng. He and his wife got married and they made a wedding band with a star ruby each inside their wedding band. Uh, the Burmese culture have quite interesting uh, 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 beliefs like uh, the ruby is supposed to give them tremendous strength. When you wear it, you can become like a uh, thousand. You know, nothing can 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 hurt you. So next one is uh, for the unheated yellow sapphire. You know, our local Indians. I have been a jeweler for the last fifteen years. My family in this business about forty five years. Uh, I have made many rings for Indians. Uh, some of them they believe in astrology, and then they get their guru. They tell them, oh, you know, you must wear this unheated yellow sapphire. So this one, I made it for this lady, and uh, she, is, uh, she bought three rings for me. So uh, on the third ring, I think this is the third ring, uh, it's about uh, seven carat, seven carat unheated uh, sapphire. And I went to her home, and I, I said, Tara, wh why you buy so many rings for me? She said, Kuming, it works. <laughs> I said, why? Oh, then she told me the story. When she was young, when she was 24 years old, very, very young, uh, her mom was like, why you don't have a boyfriend? You know, I, I want you to get a boyfriend. Then she said, oh, you know, take it easy. So what happened? The mom went to see a guru, and the guru said, hey, you must get her a yellow sapphire, seven carats, you know, no heat. And then she, 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 she did that. And that time she bought it from my father. Okay, her, her mom bought it from my father and gave it to her. And lo and behold, she said, wow, right after that, one, two years, I got a very beautiful, uh, not beautiful, very handsome man. You know, and then now they are settled down. Uh, they have three children. The children are grown up already. They, they live in uh, around Holland V. He said, yeah, everything is very good. So I want to get more because I want to change style. So she has a square one, she has an oval one, and then she has another one that's a uh, lighter color. So this is uh, in part of our culture. Uh, the next one is uh, Jade, Jade Eye Jade. Okay, this is one of the brooches I made uh, together with... Uh, this uh, uh, Li, Hua's, Li Hua jewelry's boss, uh, and, uh, and we were just discussing, discussing, and then, hey, she said, I make for you lah. So I, I got this from uh, Myanmar, and I actually do this together with her long, many years ago. Uh, and Jade, in Chinese tradition, due to all the emperors, like uh, this, this emperor called Emperor Qianlong, okay, and also this Empress Dowager, Cixi Tai Ho, uh, because of them, they made this very popular, Green Jade. Previously, they were using like white jade, nephrite jade. Uh, those of you watching at home, maybe you, in your house there's a jade. You can go and look and, and you know, take a photo and put a comment. Okay? But anyway, uh, so 
that there's a lot of folklore, a lot of amazing stories about jadeite. Uh, one of the stories I can share with you is my grandmother, she used to wear two jade bangles at the side. And uh, because we believe, she believed that uh, it protects her. And many of the Chinese people also, they have this belief about self-preservation. And uh, one day while she was bathing, my grandma really fell down in the toilet. Okay, she fell and then maybe she was thinking about life and then suddenly she just fell down. But thank goodness she had two jade bangles and she fell and she broke the jade bangle. That jade bangle is still in my safe. So every time I take a look at it, I remember. I think the jade bangle cost about 20 over 1,000. Uh. But then, one thing, she didn't break any arm. She didn't break her bones. At the time she was like 60 plus already, oh, 70 plus already. She didn't break anything. So that's a consolation. Uh. So some of you are like, wow, really, this is so magical. Well, actually, the science behind it is that the jade bangle, uh, jade itself is polycrystalline. Meaning, right, it's like a sponge. It's actually a rock. So it's a very expensive shock absorber. Okay? How does it absorb the shock? It breaks. Okay? Uh, yeah, so those of you who like to have some safety for your children, uh, uh, you can buy a cheaper one, uh, $100, $200, uh, you can wear it. Uh, so it, it really helps. But the problem is that make sure you take it out before they outgrow. Uh. If not, uh, it will stay in their hand for a long time. All right, and uh, these are some jewelry that I made for my clients over the last 15 years. Uh, the top, I will just talk about a few of them. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner is a spinel ring that I made for a Malay lady. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the way the design, when you look at it, when I say Malay lady, you say, yeah, yeah, quite, quite su suited. Uh. And, and then uh, Japanese lady, you see the yellow, yellow diamond, very small, but very nice color. You know, so you see people, different ethnicity, racial, nationality, they have a different kind of uh, taste. You know, it's like, uh, well, Sunday I think of samba you know, when I, you know. Uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, then on the top left-hand corner is a ruby. I made, uh, it's a three-carat ruby made for a Chinese man. Okay, I think he was a businessman. And then a wedding bands. And then on top is a Middle Eastern style kind of a jewelry uh, made in Israel. So... And the uh, center one, yellow sapphire, is for men, for an Indian men. Uh, he believed that it would bring him good luck and good fortune. That's why he asked me to make this one. Yeah, and, la and the right hand side is Puranakan jewelry owned by this Malay lady. Yeah. So you can see that gemstones actually become part of a culture and it's really amazing. So, what is a gem? Okay, now go back to your Slido again. And those of you at, at home, or wherever you are, go down to the uh, same place, this uh, Slido. Uh, you can scan the QR code, go to uh, hashtag love gems, and let's see, a gem is a scam. <laughs> or what, uh, everlasting, let's see, come on, get, let, the, let the answers come in, and whoa, very expensive, <laughs> make wife happy. Wow, thank you very much for those of you at home, you are so supportive, and uh, do like and share this, uh, this whole sharing session. Everlasting, wow, wow, everlasting, wow, it's very amazing, thanks for your sharing, any more, any more, wow, so, yeah, so, wow, really everlasting, huh? Okay, so I think that uh, Singaporeans and um, those people who like Malay Heritage Centre, they are very, very full of love, you know, and uh, long, long lasting, everlasting, and the second one is make life happy. Well, not bad. Uh. I was thinking that the first one was very expensive to be the top one. Uh. But actually, no. Quite amazing. Eh? Wow, this is Singapore. Eh? I'm not sure I'm in Singapore. <laughs> okay, so everlasting. Wow, this is great. Last forever. Uh, last forever. Okay, gem is. So I will give you a definition. Alright, this is. A gem is beautiful. Okay. Rare. Durable and desirable. So this is something that uh, classifies a gem. Uh, you all can know this. You can search dictionary, it will tell you also. Uh, because sometimes, you know, you can see some beautiful, you go past Malam, you see some very beautiful uh, jewelry, uh, made of glass maybe. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful, but it's not rare because maybe glass can be made anytime. And uh, durability, yes, it's durable, but it does chip. And desirable, yes, it's desirable. So we have to follow these uh, four parts, then you know it's a gem. Okay? 
So the concept here we are going to talk about is these three concepts to understand the science and art of gemstones, where value, quality, authenticity. And we always want the center part. All right, why? Because this part I can share you a story. So let's say, for example, your grandfather came to you. Your grandfather came to you and gave you a piece of uh, jewelry or gemstone. And you say, uh, my son, no, my grandson, how to say it? You say my name, uh, Kuming. Uh, Kuming, this is for you. This is worth $1 million. I said, wow. So I take it in my hand, you know. And then, but one thing, I don't know the quality. I also don't know whether is it really uh, is it authentic because I, I, I don't know. I, all I know is that my, my, father, my grandfather told me this is worth $1 million. So that's the only thing. But let's say if he comes to me and he tells me this stone, very good quality. So I, hold, I know the quality is very good, but I don't know the value. I don't know whether is it glass, red glass or ruby. So this is the thing. And last but not least, authenticity. Maybe he has a, a gem certificate. He was smart. He made a gem certificate and he gave me the stone with a gem certificate to say that this is a natural ruby and uh, it's, it's a natural ruby. But I don't know the value because the cert doesn't say it and also the quality. So these are the things that actually we, have, we struggle with and we always want the central part which is you know the value, you know the quality and you know the authenticity. So authenticity is the science, the science behind the gemstone. And uh, this is how you actually test a stone uh, when you go to a gem lab. Uh, the identity of the stone. It can be either a natural stone, it can be either synthetic or imitation. Natural means it occurs in the ground, then you mine it. Synthetic means made by us, okay, humans. And imitation, it can be also a natural stone, but it imitates something like, for example, a green, uh, a green quartz imitate an emerald, like, uh, like another stone imitate something else. And imitation can be also synthetic. A synthetic ruby, or rather a, a red glass, man-made, my glass-made, is uh, syn uh, to look like a cabochon ruby. So this is how it works. So after you deduce the, the origin, is natural? Is it natural, natural, doesn't, haven't been treated, or is it been treated? Okay, and then after that, what kind of treatment are there? Is it acceptable treatment, like it's heated, the color don't fade, or is it unacceptable, which is you put dye color, there are some ruby beads you can buy, uh, I'm, I'm not sure in Singapore, but some countries, when you go for a tour, they sell it very cheap, like $50, one ruby necklace, you know. And when you wear it, there was one time my father told me she had a customer, she bought this ruby beads, she wore it, right, with a white dress, after the half the day go through, the lady was like, her friends are, wow, Miriam, your dress looks really artistic, you know. It has a graduation of red from the top to the bottom, and uh, it looks like, uh, is, is it a Chanel? Or is it? She said, what? I was wearing a white dress. So when she looked into the mirror, she realized uh, all the dye from the ruby uh, has gone onto her clothes, and it actually went and created a new fashion. So, <laughs> so that is unacceptable, uh, okay? And then, uh, next one, if it's synthetic. So nowadays, there's this thing called synthetic diamonds, man-made diamonds, you know. So the people, and, and how you grade the, the, the value? By the synthesis method. Some synthesis method costs more than some. You know, the other day, I, was, I, I met a scientist. I met a scientist from, I think, A-Star or something, and he makes materials for lasers. And he actually had a, a stone that uh, he made in the lab and he wants to use it. He asked me to cut it, and he wants to use it as a proposal for his girlfriend. Yeah, he, for, he made one. This is made one. Made in Singapore, you know. Wow. Uh, and then you, you want to find out what's the value of the stone by the, by the synthesis method. Because some synthesis method, very cheap. You can mass produce easily. Some synthesis method take days, take longer time. So that is one of the reasons why you want to find out what are the synthesis method. And is it treated or untreated? All right? Lastly, imitation, as I explained to you before, is it natural, is it treated, uh, artificial or composite? So composite means what? They use a natural stone and then they use a synthetic stone, they put it together. Uh, this one you can find a lot uh, in many countries. So 
what they do is that they have antique jewelry. So those of us right to visit pawn shop, go and buy all the second-hand things, right? I'm not saying that they, this happened. Actually, it happened to me before because I wanted to go and look at some jewelry, and uh, they're very beautiful ruby. Wow, red color, you know. Then uh, I I look at it. I look at the inclusions. It really looks exactly like ruby. But when I tilt it to the end, normally you have to see at the side view from the side of the stone. Then you begin to see there's a glue line. Uh, one glue line, you know. Then you realize, oh, it's actually the top is ruby, but the bottom is quartz. So they stick it together. Uh, these are composites, all right? And uh, yeah, so this is something that we have to take notice. Uh, like authenticity of rubies. Unheated ruby versus natural heated ruby. So what are these? Uh, for uh, unheated ruby, you can see it has inclusions, but the heated one doesn't really have, because when you melt it, when you heat it, it removes all the inclusions. The, the inclusions melts, and then it's very clear. Uh, sometimes the unheated one is not as beautiful. Uh, sometimes the heated one looks more beautiful. So really, this is, it becomes a, a, what call it, your own preference. You, know, you, you cannot say, oh, unheated must be unheated. But sometimes unheated means uh, not so beautiful. Lah, you know? Like for example, if I came here with uh, singlet and short pants lah, and uh, slippers, lah, not, not prepared, right? But then when you heat it, right, you prepare it, you prepare it, you put makeup, like, like a lady, you put makeup and everything, become very beautiful. All right? And one thing I want to say, some, doesn't mean it's heated, means it's no good. There are some times you have like uh, big jewelry stores in the world, uh, they have 5,000 shops, maybe 6,000 shops, 10,000 shops. And can you imagine, they have only one design, right? And each shop must have at least one design. For that one design, you have 5,000, uh, and if there's no heating, uh, can you imagine all the stones, all the color, all will be different. So there's no uniformity. And because of this heating, they, play, yeah, they buy stones that are heated so that they can have a uniform collection. And this really helps in the whole design and the presentation of the brand. All right? So uh, authenticity. So synthetic ruby, you can see, wow, the color really very, very, very saturated. And then the next one is the imitation. This is a, a quench crackled quartz. It's basically red color quartz. Uh, they heat it up very hot. Then straight away, they put it in ice water. Then it cracks. Then it creates this kind of inclusions. So those people who are not really savvy, uh, look at it. Wow, got inclusion means natural. Ah, yeah, that's it, man. <laughs> this thing really happens a lot in, uh, in the mining areas. You know, where they, they actually, it's not that they want to cheat you, but other traders, they come in, uh, they do trading with these people, they actually bring in synthetic stone, they go and trade with the natives. You know, oh, this one also, mine cut already looks better, yours rough, uh, not nice, so they exchange. And then some of them inherit these uh, synthetic rubies. Uh. They, they didn't know. So when a, a foreigner, there was one time, this GI, this uh, graduate from an uh, from, uh, institution, very very, wow, I just graduated, uh, flying colors. Uh, I want to test my skill. So he went all the way to Myanmar. My father told me this story. And then he went to the gem market. He, he saw one, I want to buy the best Burmese ruby. So he took out and he went to, then this old man, uh, wow, no, I think old man or old lady, anyway, took out a very rough stone uh, from, from, from where, uh, somewhere, some hidden compartment uh, and showed it to him. He said, wow, this one, the color is so good. And only $500 it was a big stone like that. No? If you cut a big stone like this, uh, it's a three-carat stone. Uh, easily uh, for, uh, for unheated ruby with beautiful color, easily $100,000. 500 only. Uh, oh, he's still really very excited. He buy it. You know, say, yes. Then he checked the inclusion. A lot of mud. Uh, cannot see properly. So it's easy. Wow, this one. Bagus. The best. 100%. You know? So he brought all the way back to Bangkok uh, and then went to test it. Uh, washed the mud away and everything. Uh, and he saw the inclusion. It's a synthetic ruby. Wow, his hopes were dashed. So, you know, things like that do happen. And uh, please be careful. So what happens? We have gemstone certificates. Okay, different certificates that, uh, that are there. And you can tell it's a natural ruby identification. This word natural ruby, very important. Maybe I borrow the clicker. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so you see natural ruby. This one, very important. Okay. If it's synthetic, you will say. And then later on, you talk about the carrot weight. This is the carrot weight. 
and then after that, the dimensions, the cut, the shape, then the color here, they say it's vivid red, which is uh, talking about the color being very, 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 uh, very desirable. And then last, and then this part, it says no heat. This is also important. And then lastly, where is it from? Is it from Burma, Mogok, Myanmar? All right, so this, this whole certificate, you realize it don't talk about quality. It only talk about you about identity. So many people have a misconception because why are diamond, you tell me oh God, what quality it is, but then why this one don't have? Well, because there are so many different kinds of gemstones in the world. Every stone has a different standard. So it makes it very, very difficult. I want to show you a certificate. This is for a five, five carat uh, ruby. Okay, this is uh, from Gublin. Gublin, Edward Gublin, Dr. Edward Gublin, he is the founder of, he is the one that coined gemology, this term gemology. He's the father of gemology. And uh, he has a lab, he has a family that does this business. And you can see, so this is the same stone, five carat, it's five carat, and then it's Burma, it's no, no heating. And yeah, the next one, same stone, but different lab. It says uh, 5.006, here it says 5.03. And then it's a 03 there also, actually. Are there? 036. And then it says ruby with red with strong saturation, no indications of heating, origin Burma. So the information is quite similar, but it's presented in a different way. So it's the same stone, but the information looks a little bit different. Okay? Next, in art, the art of understanding the quality of gemstones. This is the art part. Yeah. Very interesting. So those of you tuning in from at home, hope you're enjoying yourself. Those of you here, please uh, bear with me. Later on, we're going to have an exciting part. Okay, sorry, uh, those of you at home cannot do. I'm going to show them some gemstones. Okay, but I'll show you something too. Okay, so those of you who are here, get ready, and we're going to have some interactive time with gemstones. So evaluating gemstones is an art. It's really, really an art. Uh, yeah, super art. So on the... <laughs> On the left side, right, you can see stones that hasn't been heated. And the right side is stones that are heated. So you see the color, uh, whoa, this one really become very vivid color. This one is like washed out color. Uh, yeah. So who, you all prefer this color? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this, this color. Uh, yeah. You know. So where it come from? Sapphires. This is a sapphire. It come from many parts of the world, from Montana, from Brazil. Colombia, Nigeria, Kenya, Tenya, uh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Thailand. Do you know Malaysia also got sapphire? Okay, there is. Uh, okay, my father went to a professor's house before. He had slabs of it. He put it in, as a floor tile. But they don't know which. They don't know. They don't know which uh, mine is it. Where is it lah? Okay, because as I spoken to you just now, that ruby and sapphire track ends in be between Dunan Road and Bukit Timah. So in here, uh, Taman. Agree, uh, or I think there's a sapphire mine somewhere there, but haven't been explored uh, because it's a nature reserve, cannot go and dig. Okay, and this is a grading system for emerald. So you see, every gemstone has a different grading system. Emerald, you see, is light, dark green, medium, medium dark, d d deep, intense, and then also for the pearls, you have what A to triple A. Sometimes it's got 4A, 5A or so, sometimes 6A. So it's very confusing because there's, the standard has not been like, fixed. Because gemstones don't just come from one country, it comes from many parts of the world. Sometimes in Singapore, the Roti Brata is Roti Brata. The Malaysia is called Roti Chennai. And then you go to another country, it's a pizza, you know, Italy, pizza. Okay? So, so these are the things, uh, it's a differentiation of terms, but actually they're talking about the same thing. And because of that, there's a very big confusion with everyone. Uh, next one is agar pink diamonds. You can see uh, there's a grading from white to 9 pp, purplish pink all the way to 1 pp, and then and so on. This is a pink diamond is 9 p. This mine just closed last year in November, so it's in Perth. Uh, those of you who visit Perth, you can ask them if you want to go and visit agar. It's there. Okay, so uh, for example quality grading of jadeite and 4C of diamond. Jadeite, you don't even see anything called 4C. Mostly, it's talking about the color and the translucency. 
So it's a very different thing, you know. Whereas here you see it's like the size, you know, the clarity and the color and the cut and the shape. So because of this, right, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions that, you know, when you buy stone like layman, uh, come and buy stones, right, you'll be like, wow, I want to just buy something interesting. But later on, you begin to realize actually it's actually a very deep subject. There's actually science and there's actually art, you know. There was a time when I... I remember I went to Jakarta, yes, Jakarta, uh, two years ago. I went to this place, uh, uh, it's called the Gem Center. It's near, it's, it's one of, it, you can just Google it, uh, it's one of the places. Uh, they sell a lot of gemstones. And inside this place, right, a lot of the Indonesian people, they are trading this thing called agate. You know, and agate is something, I think in there they call it agate. Agate, agate, agate. Uh. And, this agate, uh, they have different patterns on it. And some of the patterns are uh, like there's this uh, Allah. They have Allah on it. You know? And once you have Allah, whoa, the value becomes very high. And they, start, they try to sell it to the Sultan, some king anywhere, and they will buy because it's really very rare. Some of these patterns are natural, but some of these, they, are, they burn it. They use uh, some kind of technique to actually put like dye onto it to actually have color. But one of the things is Indonesian agate is one of the best in the world. They look like, uh, I don't know, a cartoon. Uh, you, you go and do Indonesian agate. Uh, you show you like colors you've never seen before. It's, uh, it's really brilliant and amazing. And to the Indonesian people, this is their pride and joy. Some agate uh, in, in Indonesia can cost up to 20000 or $80,000. But it's just quartz. You go to uh, Brazil, uh, the agate is how much? Hundred dollars or two hundred dollars, and then you go to Indonesia, eighty thousand. This one uh, they put there. Wow, this one special, you know, and everything. Uh, and it's eighty thousand, hundred thousand. You know, it's it's really amazing. So this different way of evaluating and also a different way of appreciating the gemstones. Some quality factors such as uh, we have learned are the four C's: uh, the carrot, color, clarity, and cut. Uh, treatment, is it unheated, is it uh, heat-treated, beryllium, glass field, these are some treatments. And uh, origin, Myanmar, Madagascar, Tanzania, Brazil, Colombia, and Afghanistan. Some countries tend to be more popular, uh, like Colombia for emeralds, uh, for Kashmir. Kashmir is between the border of Pakistan and India. Uh, they have this sapphire that is really beautiful. Later, I, I have a slide, I will show it to you. And then um, in Burma, there's also rubies and sapphires. They're also very, very amazing. Uh, others such as phenomenal gemstones, like uh, asterism, like this star again. Just now you all saw a star. This is also one with a star. And uh, color change, stones that can change color with different light. This is really, really amazing. All right. So uh, actually now, uh, we want to actually get a bit of practical. So... Uh, if it's too technical, get turned off. Huh? So gemstone must have a look at gemstones. Oh, so let's get practical. So now we are setting up the place. Yeah, when the table get there? So at this point, uh, for the live audience here, you all get to see some gemstones. I. I actually curated four trays of gemstones. Each one has uh, 10 stones. Please be careful with them. Uh, once broken, consider so. Uh, okay? So, uh, and uh, look at them in the box. And uh, put, take, th take the box out, put it in your hand, see, appreciate, you know, discuss. Uh, if you want, you can also sanitize your hands. There are hand sanitizers there if you feel that you want to uh, clear it out. Okay, give you some time to, to look at it. All right. Yeah, wow, wow. I can feel the excitement change in the room. <laughs> okay. So, okay, i just give you a few seconds more, okay? Can I have your attention again? Because we're going to look at the stones again through the whole workshop. Okay. Very excited, I can feel the excitement. Okay, let you all settle in first. Okay, let you all settle in first. 
Okay, so for those of you watching at home, uh, now I think you can see a chart here. This is called my thought process. And uh, this is when you are looking at appreciating gemstones. Uh, because beauty, uh, it really knows no bounds. Uh, those of you who are buying gemstones, first thing you must do is to set a budget. I want to spend $1,000, I want to spend $2,000. Because if not, you will go, you will go out of uh, context. So I wish cameras to look at, uh, correct? Uh? Uh, this one now, uh, okay. All right, so, look here, okay, hey, hey, sorry. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, so my friends, can you all look at the screen? All right, I know the, the stones look beautiful, more beautiful than me. Uh. Uh, yeah, but we are, you came from the same person who created us. Uh. Okay, so uh, <laughs> uh, the thought process is this, uh, carrot weight, color, uh, clarity, cut, and others. Number one, the first question to ask yourself when you look at the size of the stone, okay? Uh, those who want to take photo, please go ahead, you know, feel free to take photo. Do I like the carrot gemstone size in relation to my purpose? You know, some of uh, us, we want to make a men's ring, you know, cannot be too small, uh, you know, it's small already. So, but some men like small. Or maybe some people like to collect, like paperweight. Uh, they want the big size, all right? Uh, some of the practical tips when you are looking at it is, Browse the collection, pick out two or three stones that each catch your eye and compare the gemstones on the finger. So take the box and then put it on your finger to see the size and, and, and how they feel. Okay, the next one, color, 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 color. How does the color of the gemstone make me feel? Okay, which color do I prefer in comparison? Okay, and then uh, practical parts is browse the collection, pick out one or two stones that uh, catch you because of the color and then compare between the selection all right uh, next part is clarity is there any inclusion uh, overall part of the beauty or is it a distraction well, it is a question to ask does it distract you from the beauty or does it add to a beauty okay later i have some slides also you can see and also compare okay the next part is uh yeah uh, sorry, the practical part is place the stone, the box on your hand, and you can tilt it left, right, up, down, you know. Yeah, I'm so happy to see you all smiling and enjoying yourself. Uh, this is the important part of the whole workshop. Uh, the next part is the cut. How do you like the shape of the cut? Okay, this is very important. My friends, you all can understand the shape of the cut. A lot of times when you see, wow, uh, diamond is what excellent cut and all this. But when you look at gemstones, how does the sh do you like the shape of the cut? Does it sit very well on your finger? Do you like it pleasing to you? How do you feel of the shape? You know, when, when you look at shapes, it's very important to like it. If you don't like the shape, then yeah, no point to choose the stone. Okay? Uh, and uh, so place the stone on the fingers, different orientation. You can put it vertically, horizontally, diagonally. You know, play with the stone. Let your imagination flow. Okay? Uh, last but not least is the basically looking at the treatment and the origin and the provenance. This is more for the certificate. Okay, those of you who are at home, maybe you have a gemstone collection, go to the safe right now, pick it out, and then put it on your fingers, and join us as if you are sitting here, and we can actually do this together with you. Okay, and yes, like and share, like and share. Wow. Last night, I just had a live, la, live sale, so I always, hey, like and share, wow, this one uh, is fantastic. Okay, okay, so those of you, are you ready, my friends? Okay, no, no, cannot say anything, okay, cannot say anything. Safe management measures. Okay, okay. So, do I like the gemstone size? Okay, this is a uh, almost 100 carat uh, Mexican opal on my wife's hand. Huyin, can you show them your hand? Just uh, put like this. Yeah, so you can guess how big it is. La. Very shook, wow, I see this stone, I tell you, uh, my heart, uh, whoa, feel very happy, excited. No, this one, uh, whoa. good times, uh, this stone, 200,000. But COVID time, uh, this one now, they want to let go. Uh, I think 70, 80,000, they want to let go because they need money. All right? But I don't know whether it's still available. Uh, that time was quite nice. And then this one is smaller, it's five carats. But because of the size five carats, I can put diamonds around it. I can put uh, design around it. But this stone, no need lah. This one just put there and show off already. That's it, you know. Put on the head also. Wow. <laughs> Shining, uh, catcher, catcher, you know. Wow. Okay. So uh, I want to show a giant size. This is a giant size uh, carving. 
is emerald cut. It's an emerald. Okay, those of you at home, uh, I think you'll get a better view, right? This one, very clear, right? Huh? Okay, this is carved in Japan. And then later, if you all want, you all can see later on, uh, okay, after the talk. It's actually very intricate. But the quality of the rough, uh, I tell you, uh, actually, it's not so fantastic. But that, the guy that actually owns this, very smart. Because the quality of the stone, chantek lah, not nice lah, not beautiful lah. So he gets somebody uh, got idea, go and carve uh, make it look very beautiful. Uh. People buy the stone not because of the stone that is good, but because the carving is good. Maybe the guy, uh, he do it, uh, the chegu, uh, oh, really uh, the, the very good one. So they buy the stone not just because of the beauty of the colour, but actually the carving. Alright, so the size is a very good size. Okay, do you like this gemstone size? Okay, so see which gemstone size you like uh, on, the, on your so-called table. Alright, I put this down now, okay? Alright. And the next one, oh, this one now. Okay, now you get to see the action. See, look at this. Okay, those of you at back home, enjoy the slide. Uh, me playing with, I think this is my hand. Uh. No, I think this is weighing your hand. Uh, no, my hand, my hand. Yeah, yeah. See, look at that. Whoa, whoa. Look at the last, one more time, one more replay, replay. Replay, oh, see. This is called uh, Opal. It's a Mexican Opal. And it's so lively and fiery. Yo. See that? Okay. Next one, okay? This is a yellow sapphire, my hand again. This is a 12 carat, uh, 12, 13 carat. For men, uh, normally 10 carat up, la. then feel shook. La. But below small, eh, I uh, cannot. La. But some, some people different. Some people, their hand very small. So this one, 10 carat, I think this is about 20,000, I think. Yeah, about 20,000. Okay, uh, next one. Okay, how does the color make me feel? Okay, you go look at your, at, your, at, your, at your gemstone now. Those of you at home, look at some gemstones. How does the color make you feel? Does it remind you of a word? You know, when I look at this blue sapphire, this is from cashmere. Ah, just now I say cashmere, right? So this is a cashmere sapphire. How does the color make me feel? Okay, wow, this one very small. I don't know if you can see. No? This is a papraja color. This is a papraja. Okay, this is one of the stones, uh, although very small, uh, you see from your side, you can see the colour, uh, very captivating, like, oh, attract you, you know? well, just like this. This is a papraja. Papraja is a colour of, uh, like, orangey pink sapphire uh, with a sunset. That's how they describe, a lotus flower in the sunset in uh, Sri Lanka. So you can see, very nice colour, the colour very captivating. And colour is something that connects with your soul, uh. You, you, you see already, uh, wow, when I remember the first time I do painting, uh, I was mixing the colour, right? I start crying, you know. <laughs> I don't know why. Because it touched me, you know. Like I put the blue and the black and uh, I mix, uh, I feel like something is do going on in my heart. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so which stone that actually captivates you, the colour? Alright, which colour actually captivates you? Alright? Wow, wow, wow. Very exciting. So next one. Wow. How does the color make you feel? This is a green jadeite. On the left hand side, oh, where is it? Okay, on the, my, my palm, there's many stones. And, and the other one is uh, one stone. So the one stone, uh, and, and there's one right at my pinky, the color is deeper, it's darker. Which color do you like? Do you like a more vibrant color or do you like something more deeper color? You know, you feel that, you feel it in your soul. So this is a part where you actually use a lot of your soul to, to feel, not just your brain. Okay, both lah. You know, in the brain it will tell you, oh, it's a bit deeper in color, it's darker in color. Your brain will adjust, but then your your heart, lah, how you feel. You know, this is a very so gemstone actually is a very inward. When you you feel it, you see, oh, how does this feel? Okay. Yes. Wow. Wow. This is so good. Okay. This one color. How does color feel? On the left-hand side, is a lighter green emerald, and on the right side, is a more vivid green emerald. Okay? Uh, one of the reasons why the left side, the round stone, uh, is lighter colour is because it's round. When it's round, you reflect more light, so it looks lighter. Whereas the emerald cut uh, has less facet, uh, it, looks, it doesn't reflect so, many, so much light, and therefore, the colour is more vivid, deeper. So which one do you all prefer? Okay, I myself, actually, I like the vivid green. Uh. The small one, I mean not the small one, the, the lively one is more of like a sparkle. Okay, let me show you another colour. Do you like this colour? This is a 
Burmese ruby. This is uh, 16 karat. It's a deep red color. I would say maybe pigeon blood color. Okay? Yeah, so this is a big stone from Burma. This is a heated stone. Mm. Yes, yes. Okay, the camera looking. And those of you, look at the stones again. See which color do you really like. Does it match your skin tone? Does it match your, your dressing? You know, which is a stone that you make it into a pendant? Which one will make it into a ring or, or a brooch? You know, think about it. Think about that, right? Okay, next part. This stone has a very interesting name. It's called Jeremy Jervite. Okay, this is a rare stone. Every, every, every month, people are discovering a new mineral. And they actually name the minerals after some Thing, like Jeremy Jimovite. Maybe the, the, the doctor name was Jer Jeremy or something like that. Okay? And uh, this is a 10 carat one from uh, Africa. It's for clarity. So now look at the stones that you have there on the table. Is there any stone inclusions? Because many people, their understanding of clarity is through diamonds. And diamonds, uh, they put it as a flaw because the more clarity issue, uh, the lower price, lower value. But in gemstone, uh, I tell you, this fern, uh, you see this one? This is called rutilated quartz, okay? Those of you who can see at the live audience and those who are at home, this is called rutilated quartz. This are uh, root house, it's another mineral inside the quartz. So, very special, it grows like a star, okay? This is because of the crystal structure, you can see. And if I grade this using uh, diamond terms, this will be I1, uh, I3. That means lowest of the lowest quality. Okay, but it's so beautiful. It's like attractive. It's so uh, amazing how it grows. All right, and so you can look at the stones there. Any inclusion that distract you, you know, or anything that you like about the stone growth. All right, so let's go in. So this is how uh, I put it back. Okay, I put it back. So you can see the video. You can see wow, the shine is there. You know, the shine is there. You really don't see any inclusion. It's like me putting the hand like this. So when you look at the stones, right, you put it on your hand and you look with a distance because it's not going to look like this. Huh? And you look like that and then I can play again. You see, I'm playing with the stone. I'm, I'm, I'm playing life right, up, down, you know. Uh, interact with the stones. Stones are something that you have to interact with. You look at them, you play with them, you walk, you look at it in... Uh, right now, I'm in an exhibition center. The best place uh, to see gemstone is outside, under the sun. Okay, but not the afternoon sun, uh, because hot, uh, okay? But, but also because it's too strong, because afternoon sun is a bit orange, all right? The best time to see stones is 9 a.m., 8 a.m., when just have a, then the sun just came out, uh, the color don't have color, all right? If you see stones in the night, like uh, 4, 5 o'clock, right? The ra it's more reddish, the sunlight is more reddish, okay? There were times when I bought a stone of the spinel on the road in uh, Myanmar, in Yangon, at this place. And then I saw the red color was so beautiful. It was like captivating. It was like this kind of red. This kind of red. Huh? And those of you at home, okay, this kind of red. I was so excited because I bought a gem. But when I came back to Singapore, I took back the same thing. Huh? I was so disappointed. It looked brown. Then I was like, ah, yeah, alama, you know, why like that? No. Because in Singapore, the sunlight, the angle of incident is different. Like for example, uh, those of you who go to Indonesia, Indonesia, the light there is also more, more strong. Uh, the place where I can really remember the light is better is Philippines. When I went to this place called Ilo Ilo, when I look at the paddy field, uh, wow, the paddy field is like glowing color. You know? In Singapore, you don't see this kind of color one because of the angle of incident. All right? So gemstone is also very fun because uh, Singapore, this color, you go to London, different color, you go to America, also different color. So certain colors actually is for different market. Yeah. Because you know why? Those places uh, that has less sunlight, uh, they like a lighter color. But it's because Singapore have a lot of sunlight, uh, we, we tend to go for a more deep, dark, darker color. All right? So let's go. You see, under the loop, then you realize, hey, actually got inclusion in the stone. You see, there are actually lines on the stone. You can see, you know? oh, yeah, yeah, very clear. <laughs> huh? But when you saw it from the hand, uh, Don't have. You see, don't have. Uh, so this is where inclusion play a part. Uh, when a stone is totally clean, first thing, uh, the price go up a lot uh, because everybody say very rare, very rare. But there's a threshold 
that you can take. Hey, actually, it's beautiful because it become an identification feature. Something special only I have. Other people don't have. It's an identification feature. And gemologists like me, we study this to actually ascertain what stone is this, where the stone come from. All right? Yeah. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Uh, which, which, which stone is distracting? On the left-hand side is uh, one carat, fancy, intense, pink, purplish pink, uh, with a lot of spots. But actually, if you don't look at it closely, it, it kind of complements, because in the, in the stone normally, when you look at those faceted stones you turn, uh, there's a lot of black spots on the stone also, like all, all your stones, okay? You look at stone, you flip it around. Because they're light leakage, the light uh, don't 100% come back to your eye. Some of the light go in the stone and come out from the back side. So it has a very black spots. So when you look at the stone here, it's carbon crystals on the stone. Yeah, and then on the right-hand side, is a stone with inclusions, with rutiles. Again, rutile inclusions, all right? Rutile inclusions that is very unique, very unusual, that actually adds the value to the stone. In the diamond, this will be very, worth very little, but because it's a gemstone, it creates an art. It creates some kind of uh, invoking kind of feelings, okay? Yes. Yeah, but depends, depends. If, depends, if... This one, is it? This one? Yes. Okay, this one is not a scratch. This is an internal feature. It's inside the stone. So it's, you can see it's... Uh, it's not a scratch because the scratch won't be like, like this. And, and when you use a reflected light, like you shine the box, uh, you, if you are see the box, okay, you all take the box in your hand, you shine on the box, if you see scratches on the box with the reflected light, you can see actually there are scratches. And then at a certain angle, you don't see, those are scratches on the box. But this, what I'm talking about is inside the stone. Yeah, this is part of the thing. No, 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 this inclusion. Inclusion is like a birthmark. It's like my backside got one birthmark. Uh, you know, I mean, on my hand also got like, on my face, you know, got a birthmark, you know. It's part of the stone. It, it, it grows with the stone. Because at that certain, certain point, there was this mineral. And every stone you see uh, are a few million years old. So suddenly one visitor visited, uh, some mineral was there, and it formed inside the stone. And it actually become part of the stone. This is where inclusions form. All right. Okay, Neil. Okay, now look at the stone. What is the shape? How is the shape of the gemstone? Which one do you all prefer, the left side or the right side? Okay, a lot of people like the right side, which is a bit rounded. Okay, okay rounded. Okay, the left. Okay, my left, my left. Okay, round. This is called a cushion cut, rounded corners. Then on the, the other side is actually sharp corners. Some people prefer this. You know, generally, uh, rounded corners easier to set. Because you just use four claws, it can hold. But then, uh, for the sharp corner, you cannot just use four claws because not enough grip. You need to use eight claws, two claws to hold it there. So, in terms of design also, this also plays a very big part in the designing of the jewelry. Alright? Okay, so, oh, this one, fantastic. Uh, this photo is about half a million dollar worth of uh, stones. Okay, very, very nice, huh? very short. Okay, so uh, there are all three carat diamonds uh, and four carat. So you can see different shapes. Uh, the bottom one, the 0404 FVS2, that one very nice, well-rounded, you know, nice marquise shape. Then on the, on the left-hand side, the, you have one marquise that one shoulder is like very rounded. The other one is very graduated. So you know what I mean? This kind of stone, right, it, it, you put it by itself, right? Yeah, it, by itself, it's very, um, it, it, the shape is not symmetrical, uh, basically. Okay, so in terms of shape-wise, the best is this one. Okay? I mean, yeah. In the end, this one got sold because it was a connecting part to a pendant. It wasn't the main feature piece. Alright? So next, uh, how is the shape of the gemstone? One is a tapered cut with four corners. And another one is a emerald cut with eight sided. All right, a lot of people like this kind of cut because it looks more complete. This one is like a story. Halfway through, then stop already. You know, suddenly you wake up. You know, 
Okay. So next one is uh, how is the gemstone shape? Or one, this one is a very nice uh, shape that can be used for almost any kind of jewelry because it's well proportioned. But on the right hand side is a very long piece. This one normally they set it for pendants. It's very long, you know. And when they have this, you put it in a ring. You need a very special design. So this affects the, the usability of the stone. Sometimes some stones are very thin. Uh, wow, that one, don't know how to set. Because when you set, it breaks also. Okay, so this is some of the considerations. It's 66 carat, uh, 66 carat tourmaline. Wow, this one are nice heart shape. So different kind of heart shape. Uh, which heart shape you all like? You see, this one is one of them. This is another one, and then this is nice. So you can see this shoulder very well curved. Okay, a lot of time, heart shape, uh, the problem is the cleavage. I mean the, the center part, like this part, all right? Because very hard to cut. You don't, have a saw, you, you don't have a proper saw to cut it. You must have a proper tool to cut this, all right? Normally, it's not so deep. It's a bit shallow because it's easier to cut, okay? And last but not least, some phenomenal gemstones. So I want to show you this phenomenal gemstone, which is uh, alexandrite, okay? I don't know, uh, can those people at home, can you tell me what color it is? Those of you here, uh, I know you cannot speak out, uh, but you're just, you know, just think. Okay, I'll, I'll take out my phone, which is a white color light. Here I have a mixed light of uh, white and orange. So I have like reddish color. Those of you who see reddish, can you nod your head? Yeah? Can you see reddish color? Do you see reddish color? Uh, have a thumbs up, thanks for the thumbs up. Okay, and I put the torch, uh, you see what color you see now? Like green, huh? Do you see green? So this is a phenomenal gemstone. Okay, those of you, oh sorry, <laughs> uh, green. Okay, green. You see what color? Reddish, huh? Like brownish, reddish kind of color. This is called alexandrite. This is a phenomenal gemstone. And uh, those of you at home, because you are viewing it through a camera, the color will definitely be different, because every um, the CCD CCD is different. The, the camera is different, so they look different color. So white is a green. So put under white light is green color. And then this is red color. All right. Okay. Phenomenal. Another one, star. Can you see a, can you see a star? Do you see a star? And see, right? Okay. The, right at home, this is a star. So I think some of you have star stones. Uh, or, not, or, or moonstone. I think you have moonstone. So this is a star sapphire from Myanmar. This is a star. All right, this is the phenomenal effects of gemstones. So uh, those of you who have a handphone torch, you can use a torch. The handphone torch is one of the best tools that you can use for looking at gemstones because it's always with you. And then you can take photo, and then you can share with your friends and ask them. Some can buy now. <laughs> okay, can uh, I take a uh, show? And last but not least, one of my favorite stones, my cat's eye. See my cat's eye, this is 34 carat. Y'all can see, very beautiful. Okay, 34 carat cat's eye. Where I show the people first. Okay, okay, cats. Okay, now show the online audience. Hello, online audience. Uh, this is a cat's eye. Those of you who have cats at home, please treat your cat nicely. Okay? Yeah, this is a cat's eye. It's 34 carats. Cat's eye normally when it's big, uh, then it's very majestic. When it's small, it's very, like, don't, don't have feeling. Okay. I think that's all for this part. Let me go back to the, finish up the rest of the part. Let me go back to the pedestal here. Uh, value, wow. Okay. Oh, I'm still in time. Thank God. Okay. So the last part of the whole thing is art, science, and culture. Value. Okay, this is where a lot of Singaporeans get very excited because talk about dollars and cents. Huh? Okay. And uh, okay, those of you at home at here, can we do a poll just to liven things up a bit? I did a lot of talking just now. Uh, scan it, love gems. Which gemstones are more valuable? Which gemstones are more valuable? Emerald, pearls, come keep the ideas coming in. And those of you at home, please uh, help us and, and uh, participate together. Let's see who gets the first click. Uh, I, let's see, who say diamond? Um, let's see. Oh, diamond. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, emerald. Wow. Come on, come on. Give me, give me a sapphire. Oh, rest. And a pose. Anybody on pose? Oh, oh. 
is a tie between emerald, ruby, and diamond. And Sapphire is lagging behind. Who will be the most valuable gemstone? Find out very, very, very soon. And we, wow, so many people putting emerald. Wow. In, in Malay, it's called Zamrut. Huh? Is it Zamrut? Yeah, Zamrut. Huh? Emerald, oh, ruby and emerald are actually a tie between, and Sapphire is trying to get up. And nobody chose anything else. Oh my goodness. How about opal, topaz, jade, tanzanite, turquoise, opal, pearls. Oh, wow, suddenly, the, the, they are trying to get a comeback. And wow, and amber, and amethyst, tanzanite. Wow, people are starting to respond to the thing. Come on, my friends. Uh, we wait another few more seconds. And Emerald is still the champion. My goodness. Wow. For those of you who are watching here who are dealers, you know what to do. Huh? You know what to do. <laughs> and uh, you, you must uh, pay royalties to uh, the National uh, Malay Heritage Center. <laughs> okay, Emerald. Wow, this is a very interesting statistics. And uh, any more, any more? Keep them coming in. Any more? Counting 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the winner is Emerald. <laughs> hey, I'm very surprised, like, really. Because you know what happened? Emerald is actually very hard to get in this region. Because Emerald, most of it occur in Africa, occur in Brazil, Colombia, South America, which is quite hard to get there. For here to travel to uh, to Colombia, you need two to three days. You don't need to change aeroplane and all this thing. Lah. I have a friend who deals with emeralds. Every time he go there, it's two, three days traveling. And then when you travel there, you also got to go to the, to the right place. Lah. And uh, it takes a long time. And to, for emeralds to come here, that's why you don't see so many emeralds here. You get to see more emeralds uh, in the Middle East region uh, because uh, in Israel, it's one of the cutting centers and also India is a cutting center for uh, emeralds. Or in Jaipur. Okay, so there were 11 participants. Thank you very much, all of you, for participating. And we move on. So all gemstones are precious. I know some of us, we heard before, are oh, semi-precious. But actually, semi-precious, the term actually doesn't mean so much because how can be half precious? Okay, it's precious means precious, lah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, why? These are some factors, okay? The beauty, durability, rarity. Demand, tradition, portability. So tradition is one of it that pushes uh, uh, gemstones up because when people get married, they buy precious stuff for people. They buy diamonds, they buy rubies, sapphires. And then sometimes certain festivals, you give uh, certain uh, uh, stones. Uh, for example, me and my dad, we did uh, some, some valuation work for one of the temples, Indian temples in Singapore. And we found a lot of uh, emeralds, diamonds, rubies. And then the priest was telling us, the trustees were telling us, oh, this one is the offering they give to, the, to their deities. And, and this is part of their culture, you know. So really, uh, there are so many traditions. And the last part is actually uh, portability. Where because gemstones really are very portable, they can go all over the world uh, very easily. Uh, and uh, that's why in, Arabs, in this area, it actually is a gem trading center where people from Southeast Asia come here and actually trade gemstones, they sell it to the king and then and to people around here. So these are actually the factors that actually increase the value of gemstones. Uh, I'll give an idea. Uh, diamond pipeline in 2019, it was worth, uh, it was from $7.8 billion, it went to become $78.13 billion. This is how much the industry is, is, uh, is worth. Lah. You know, a lot, really a lot of uh, the value. So why you say, wow, inflated like 10 times? Eh? Of course, because here you, you got to do sorting, you got the mining, and these are just the cost of mining. After that, you have to sort it out. You have to, there are actually 16,000 categories of rough diamond. You can sort it out 16,000 categories. All right? And that's why it's so amazing. Then after they go to the site holders and the cutters, they cut it, the wholesalers, the manufacturers, and to the retail store. A lot of value in this whole chain. For example, insurance, logistics, transport costs, cutting costs, you know, friendship costs, all sorts of costs, you know, all are there. And then about the gemstone pipeline. Gemstone pipeline uh, in, the in 2015, the world estimated is 9 billion. But of course, a lot of it wasn't so much reported. Uh, and therefore, 
they don't have exact figures. In Singapore, it's now a regulated trade. The last two or three years ago, Ministry of Law actually stepped in to get everyone that deal with gemstone and diamonds to have a license. So we have to report to them, uh, and therefore it's pretty much regulated right now. So uh, you can see it's quite, uh, it goes both ways. You know, mining, you can go to the rough dealer. The cutter also can do mining. You know, sometimes, uh, I tell you a story, there's this guy, he owns a piece of land in Sri Lanka, he a uh, good caste bungalow, okay? Good caste bungalow, we have very big, uh, this uh, what you call it, garden. And then while walking in his garden one day, uh, he picked up a sapphire. He said, oh, there's a sapphire here. So he told all his friends, this is in Ratnapura, hey, my, my, my garden got sapphire, you come and dig for me, we split the commission. So really, you know, well, he bring a lot of people in, and the time my, my association, the Jeweler Association of Singapore, and us, we were there, we were invited to his house, and there was a mine in front of his garden, you know. I said, Uncle, why are you doing this? Oh, this is my mine. I said, wow, really? Uh, you know, last time, uh, when, you, when you buy property there, you don't just look at the location, wow, how good, how near the city. There also, you look whether got gemstone inside your ground. Uh, okay, and then uh, I, I went into the mine. It's not a very deep mine. It's on only six meters long. Uh, but six meters is quite high. Like. It's higher than an overhead bridge like, in Singapore. Okay, no harness, nothing. I had climbed like that. Whoa, I tell you, I was shivering. Uh. But it was a very exciting experience. And uh, yeah, he picked up that sapphire. And one of the sapphire he mined was a few hundred carat. Hundred, uh, yellow sapphire. It sold for about 100,000, he told me. And he shared with the whole village. So the whole village prospered because of this guy. So uh, those of you who own a GCB, uh, please go and check your garden. Uh. Maybe you find something. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, so funny. So anyway, this is the whole thing, and uh, there's a pipeline. So there's a distribution channel, and therefore, actually, it's very valuable. All right, and now there's the manufacture of artificial materials. Okay, so in auction results, this is all the figures. All right, wow. In Burma auction, 1.2 billion. Christie's, 163 million. Sotheby's, 64 million. Yeah, wow. And it's really a lot of money like, all over the world. The auctions is one of the places. Those of you who are curious, you can go to their website. There's all the public information. You all can go and take a look. And actually, gemstones, they are really very valuable. In conclusion, all right, most people have difficulty understanding authenticity, quality, and therefore value. And there are many factors involving evaluating of gemstones. Understanding the individual types of gemstones is essential. Last but not least, the crucial consideration for evaluating a gem are its treatment, origin, and followed by quality. Final thoughts. My friends, last one. Come on. For old time's sake, let's uh, do this little together. Do you think that gemstones and jewelry are an important part of us? Those of you at, at home, uh, scan it. Yes, wow, everybody is doing it together. Very good. Thank you very much. Last question of this before I hear your questions. Uh, yes, wow, well, yes, one person answer yes. Yes, yes, that's true, okay. Any more? Anybody want to answer this question? Definitely yes, wow, amazing. Anybody say no? Or maybe, or I don't know, also can. Yes, wow, yep, definitely. Oh, the answers coming in, that four people answered, yes, absolutely, wow, what a strong one, absolutely. I could feel the enthusiasm in that word, absolutely. Wow, gemstones, and five people, for example, clock has quartz. That's right, you know, quartz is one of the few, uh, one of the stones that actually vibrates. It vibrates 32,000 hertz when you put electricity to it it vibrates and therefore it can produce a pulse. That's why seconds. Okay? And uh, yeah, so confirm. Wow, <laughs> confirm. <laughs> this must be from the military. Uh. Confirm. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding, okay? Those of you are in online and those who are here, I hope you all already enjoy because I really enjoy this gemstone. Uh. Okay, I've been growing up with them since I was young, but I didn't know that they were precious, you know? So only only later part of my life that I realized, oh, that day the red color marble, uh, I thought it's marble, uh, I, I thought it's golly, uh, I went to throw, uh, and then uh, then I, it's a ruby, uh, oh man. Okay, thank you very much for your, your input. I want to remember the first idea that I talked to you about, can gemstones, uh, the science of gemstones and art of gemstones influence culture? I think you all have already answered me. And 
without further ado, I want to leave you all with this. The, one of the tech phrases that have been said is the Hara Maniara Waja Sampai Kaputim, which is actually stay vibrant and resilient until the end. And from my travels, I have traveled to so many gem producing countries. The people there are really resilient. From the Burmese people, to the Sudanese people, to the Kalimantan people, and even to people that are you know, the Jewish people in, in Israel, they are cutting gemstones all the time. They are all very resilient and they are very vibrant. So my friends, our vision is to be a, for the Gem Museum is to be a platform that bridges the gemstone industry with the rest of the world. These are some places you can actually connect with us, subscribe to our YouTube channel, the Gem Museum, Kuming, and, my, and these are the places you can actually go. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And the Q&A, for those of you, uh, please scan. And if you want to do Q&A, we can do Q&A. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Kunming. Sir, hello. Thank you, Kunming, for um, your sharing. Uh, actually, a lot of information there. I think I, I learned quite a bit. Actually, I wanted, you answered one of my questions before I asked. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, about the, how, uh, how some regions uh, prefer lighter colors to others. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was because of sunlight. Yeah, la, sunlight. Right? Yeah. So here, a lot of sunlight, everything looks brighter. So yeah, we yeah. prefer that color. That's right. Okay. I, I think I noticed that also just now when, when you showed some of your gemstones uh, and you asked which one they preferred, everyone here answered for the darker, more vibrant colours. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Wow. So I think that's one of the phenomenons. Um, okay, I just want to open up, uh, warm you up with a few questions before we, we uh, receive questions from Slido. Does the value of gemstone depreciate over time or not? Uh, depreciate over time? Yeah. Um, Yes and no. Because why? For example, diamonds. Diamonds in the 1980s, right, uh, it hit the all-time high. A one-carat diamond, uh, D-color, flawless, was about 60 over 1,000 US dollars. But now, in the market, for the same stone, it's only about 20 over 1,000 dollars, valued by the market. So a lot of people say, wow, why like that? You know? Well, because in the 80s, right, there were, technology wasn't so advanced. And therefore, the mining methods were still very, uh, not so well, 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 well versed. La. And because of that, it opened, now there's more mines available, there's more supply. And also, previous time, there was not enough data to actually, because market price, market price is all about data, where there's enough people buying the stone and there's enough people selling the stone. When there's a shortage of either, the price will fluctuate. So therefore, uh, because of this, market also changes. Like also people's feeling for the stone. Uh, for example, you know, some people will say um, uh, diamond now is not the in thing anymore. They prefer uh, gemstones like rubies or sapphires. So that, because of that, the value of the stone also fluctuates. Last but not least, it's really a willing buyer, willing seller. So if you that day, uh, you walk up from the wrong side a bit, I uh, don't know how to negotiate your price. Uh, then that's it, uh, you lost the value. Uh. But if you really know how to negotiate, uh, you can increase the price. So one very good tip is for everybody who collect gemstones, go and study how to negotiate. <laughs> go and take a course. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, you, you, you. Just now we, we looked at how art and science uh, are yeah. supposed to in, inform uh, the, the story of the gemstone. Actually, I think uh, tradition as, as well, one of the things that you mentioned later on, um, so uh, certain beliefs, cultural beliefs, are yes. attached or attributed to the gemstones, like in, yes. in depending on certain culture, right? Yes. Um, I think all the uncle uncle on that table like, would would uh, <laughs> agree with me. In Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, there's a certain belief within the Malay community um, that certain stones have magical properties, yes. can can protect you from evil, maybe can. Uh, bring wealth, yes. uh, can you know, him improve your health, collection, etc. In, in your, I mean, all these stories, like, all sorts of stories. Yes. And I think it also has an impact on the value of that stone. Of course. Ah, so I sell you this stone. <laughs> ah, it's not just about I'm selling you the science or the art. I'm also telling you the, uh, selling you the story, right? Yeah. Yeah. In your experience, what is the, one of the most amazing stories you've heard that is attached to a particular stone, whether it's magical or cursed or what? Okay. It's not the famous. This is quite close stones. to home, okay? I think okay. it's quite close to home. One of my uncle, <laughs> my mother's oldest uncle, no, my mother's, mother's oldest brother, he's staying in JB right now. 
if he's watching, uh, uh, uncle, this is you thought, a jiku. Uh, <laughs> this, he bought one stone from the uh, Chinese market. No? And one day he was there touring some part of China, I cannot remember, and he bought a blue stone. No? It's supposed to be turquoise. But then, uh, and then he brought it back home. No? And then, nobody tell him that got power. No? But after he bought that stone, no? wow, all his stock and shares went up. No? His business started to boom. He was in the export business, he's selling flowers to Singapore. And a lot of things start to boom, you know. Until uh, the friends say, hey, what do you do to your life, man? Then he said, whoa, I tell you, I buy this stone, uh, very power, you know. Then his friend don't believe. He said, never mind, uncle, you lend it to me for two weeks, you know. So he took it into his house, uh, his business will start to boom, you know. Until the fact that he actually want to buy the stone over for my uncle. But my uncle said, this is not for sale, this is for me. So when I went to visit him for Chinese New Year, he said, hey, Kuming, you want to see my magic stone? <laughs> then I look at him, what magic stone? See me magic stone. Ching yeah, you know, like already, you know. And then I went to his bedroom, you know. And then I go to my bedroom and see, like, there, at the side there. Then, wow, very messy. Then suddenly you got one stone at the side corner there. Then to closer inspection, uh, the stone is not turquoise. It's actually a dye color mag magnesite. You know, it's like, what's this, man? So, yeah, I, I heard stories like this, uh, that it be well's me. La. It's not actually turquoise. It's a nether stone that is an imitation of a turquoise. But it made him rich. Okay, so that's why I want to say uh, he's a generalizing thing. Yeah. You know, sometimes you, you drink this water, suddenly uh, I cannot soto or something. You know? <laughs> it's, you, know, you know what I mean? People like to create stories or so. I'm not saying that he's so, but things happen certain ways. People cannot understand it, cannot, cannot really put a thing to it, so they attribute something they've done. Oh, because I wear this ring. Because I... And also, it, it sounds good. Because when you wear this ring, uh, wow, become very... When you tell people, easy to talk also. You, 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 to tell them, hey, I actually went for a course. You know, I got a person to teach me all this thing. Easier to say, hey, I bought this ring that day. Uh. Wow, power lah. You know, where already suddenly become he-man. Uh. All the girls start to look at me and say, wow, this guy very good. My business is so prosper. So, it's a very very subjective thing because it deals with your soul and many times yeah so okay then my next question would be uh can i borrow that stone for your uncle for two weeks oh uh, yeah yeah you better talk no to la, la, la. <laughs> okay uh we have some questions from slido uh in i'll just go to one this guy was asking most expensive stones must be diamond right example the hope stone i think just now you asked for the pole yeah uh, emerald it's emerald right what is actually in your experience the most expensive stone so far I know the price fluctuates, la, but in I the market right now or in, in, in your uh, career, what has been the most expensive stone? The most example? expensive stone that I know of is the red diamond. Okay, even the Sultan of Brunei, they collect it. You know, when it first came out, it was, it was very special. And red diamonds, uh, they occur mostly from Argao Mine, which is in uh, Australia. And the mine just closed last year. So the supply has been severely affected. And red diamonds, uh, I, I remember, uh, one and a half carat. Very small. One and a half carat means what? I don't know. Maybe like, like this size, like 6 mm. Lah. It's about, uh, the, the, there's a jeweler in Singapore. He bought it there were in, I think, 2017, 2018 for about 2.2 million US dollars for a small stone. Lah. One point something one, carat. One point five carat. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, and, and I think now the value is like 10 million. Uh, and its value is that high because it's, it's rare? Uh, rare, it's beautiful, mm. durable, and also uh, it has a market. The people that want to buy this stone, they really have the money to buy the stone. <laughs> they appreciate it. There are certain stones that are rare, but then there's no market. Mm. You know, like for example, the general Jimmy White is very rare. I think the stone, the whole stone worth about 20, 30,000. But it's big stone, no? 10 carat, no? compared to this one small little diamond, no? two over million. Oh, that's mad. Yeah. Okay. But red, red diamond is also a trend thing, right? I think uh, when your, your dad gave his lecture, we were talking about how uh, white diamond was uh, favoured once upon a time. Yes. Coloured diamond, not so much. Yes. But that changed uh, in the past few yes. decades or so. The right? last uh, 30, 20 years, uh, 20 it years. Yeah. I have a story. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Please. Uh, this uh, Jewish diamond dealer. Okay. He was telling me, he, in Singapore, he was he born and lived in Singapore. Okay. But now uh, he's retired. He told me one time he ordered a parcel of diamonds from Antwerp, and then when he came, it was like a uh, forty carats of stones, and they were all coloured diamonds, and he ordered actually uh, white diamonds. You know. 
he was so furious with the, the, the dealer. He said, why you send me this? This is no good. No. And then he returned the parcel. <laughs> he looked at me. Uh, he said, Kumi, I wish I didn't return the parcel. If, I, if not, I'll be a super million, million, million heir already. Yeah, because inside they got pinks, got blues, got everything. And that time, uh, it was valued very low because nobody understand, you know. And the thing about humans is when we don't understand, we don't think it's valuable. But when we start to understand, we realize the value behind it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, there's the next question. In your career, has gemstones been purchased more for technical purpose, technical reasons or scientific reasons? The, the cut, I think. Uh, technical reasons or scientific reasons? Mm. Maybe I'll rephrase this one. Uh, I think maybe uh, because you mentioned art and science instead. Yeah. So you, you shared with us the, the art of the yes. stone and also the, the yes. science. So yes. perhaps, yeah. yeah. That's perhaps what the question is leading yeah, to. Yeah, many so. people uh, who are not sure about gemstones tend to buy it technically. Like, oh, I need to get this cut, I need to get this color, I need to get this, which is actually an attribute rather than actually admiring it and letting it grow on you. Because art, you know, la, you cannot say, oh, the Picasso will have to be this, this, this stroke, and then this stroke, and then this stroke, and copy, you know. Subjective. You know, so when you become that, you really analyze it, but uh, in, in terms of uh, buying gemstones, you really have to see the beauty. Yeah. And the and, science... And how it makes you feel, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, how it makes you feel. That's why uh, you look at it, it's like art. No? When you see a beautiful Picasso, uh, or... Uh, or Rembrandt, uh, when you look at it, suddenly you just are transported into another era. When you look at it, you say, wow, this is... Stone also can be like that. With the colour of the stone, when you put it there, wow, what's this? Suddenly you are transported into a different field, you know? Yeah. Okay, uh, okay so this person wants to know, has synthetic gemstones affected the market significantly in recent years? The white diamond... Uh, industry has been affected in a sense it has a bit of a calibration because now they start to make uh, synthetic diamond jewelry uh, recently I have a I have a friend's friend who came to me he bought a diamond online uh, synthetic diamond online uh, because he and his girlfriend they don't really bother about whether it's synthetic or not you know just want to have a diamond okay so uh, so that means one less customer for a natural diamond la. but that, that with that said also the market has expanded, you know, because synthetic diamond makes diamonds more available to people. You know, if you, it's, it costs less than a diamond, a natural diamond, but it makes uh, the market grow bigger. So maybe there's a differentiation. Now there's actually a lot of correcting coming on because mm. people are wondering, is it really natural diamond really more valuable now? Or is it because, you know, the rarity? Because when, they become, when the synthetic diamonds become more, in a way, the proportion of natural diamonds will become less if you look at it in the ratio. Mm. So it might push prices up again. Now, actually, the diamond prices are going up. Uh, there was a cut down of rough, price, rough uh, buying, uh, rough production also, and suddenly the demand. Now a lot of people are shopping online uh, at home and they cannot travel. Uh, what they do? They buy diamonds uh, or they buy expensive things. Uh, the Rolexes now also, the price is going up. And then, uh, yeah, luxury goods are going up. Mm. So it, it's a very unusual time now. Uh. Okay. Yeah. No, but but the, you you mentioned diamond. What about other gemstones? Uh? Oh, other gemstones not so much, uh, because much. Uh, synthetic gemstones has been around for a long time. If you look, if you all have quartz watches, uh, it's made of synthetic quartz, you know. And then inside the stone, uh, like for example, you have a Rolex or what they say sapphire glass, you know. That that sapphire glass, right? It's actually synthetic sapphire, and uh, it's actually used a lot. Like uh, synthetic gemstones are used in warheads. I don't know if you want to know, okay, warheads, because sapphire hardness is 9, uh, means, right, you can armor pierce anything like cheese, okay, you can go through anything very, very short. So, it's been used for a lot of other purposes, rather than just uh, uh, jewelry. Like, for example, lasers, when they manufacture certain materials to make lasers, they need to be very clean, and then they can only make it synthetically, they cannot make it, in a, cannot get a natural gemstone. So, gemstone-wise, the synthetic market is pretty well developed, uh, they use it for uh, for all these kind of other users, industrial users. Yeah. Are, are you able to tell the difference between uh, a, a natural diamond or a natural gemstone and a synthetic one? Okay, for a natural diamond and a synthetic diamond, with your naked eye, very difficult. Because a lot of it is at the microscopic level, 
where you need to use advanced instrument to actually test it. Whereas gemstone, uh, uh, a bit easier la, because normally gemstone when you occur, right, is a mixture of different elements. And normally color is not pure one. You will have like a bit of, if it's red, right, uh, if it's red, maybe it's orangey red or purplish red. But when a synthetic diamond, a synthetic ruby, uh, it's very strong red and it's one color because they can cut it at a certain angle, which is the C axis, to make it the best color. But in natural gemstones, very difficult. And then you also, when you look at a, a synthetic gemstone, uh, because the value is lower, right, the person cutting it, uh, don't have, you can see the way he cut the stone. Uh, don't, 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 start the other sayang. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, ah, this one, ah, uh, your this one, any one cut. Uh, Where's the one that is very precious? Uh, oh, you can see the way it's cut, uh, very nice, very proportioned. So these are some of the telltale signs of, uh, of a synthetic gemstone and a natural gemstone. Yeah, of course, in the lab, there are actually proper ways to test. Uh, but, you know, using common sense. Uh, no, I mean, if, 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 you're, if you go to the shop, you won't have a lab, right? Yeah. You, you just go see, you know, through naked eye, how can you tell? I mean, that's, of course, you, you shared with us that these gemstones should have certificates. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, that's not always available, right? Yeah. But, yeah. The, be the best way, right, is really ask questions. Where is this stone from? But the thing is this, uh, the sales guy will get very irritated by you. Uh. <laughs> but you can test a person whether he's really you know his stuff or he don't know. You ask him where is the from, you know, who's the mother, who's the father, you know, <laughs> you know uh, where, uh, where is it cut in, where is the stone coming from, does it have a certificate, what is the carrot size, what is the dimension. You know, things like that uh, really tell you a lot. So yeah, yeah, I have a certificate. Then straight away you, he will show you. Then, oh, is it natural stone? You know, uh, why is the color like this? You know, things like that. You know, as, as we, even when we come to the Malay Heritage Center, yeah. when we look at things, we kind of become inquisitive. Mm. So inquisition is actually a very good skill to know in actually looking at gemstones. Like I said before, before, go and learn how to negotiate. Uh, this is also one thing. You, you ask all these questions and you find out more about the stone. The more information you have, the more you know, okay, this is most likely is natural. Then if you still need, uh, additional confirmation, bring it to a lab and certify it. Yeah. All right. Um, right. Is it true diamond from Africa value more than from different parts of the world like Indonesia, taking into account all four seas being equal? Oh, this question many times with it. Uh, okay, so how to do it? So the rough material, right? Certain, uh, oh, very exciting. Actually, I wanted to bring it. Uh, I have three stones uh, that my father had, we bought from uh, for Landak River, from uh, Kalimantan, from Pontianak, Ngabang. And I actually sent it to Israel to cut. After it cut, my father gave it to my mom. Lah. So when I see the stone, uh, wow, very, very sparkling and very uh, amazing. So one of the reasons why people feel like, oh, certain country is better than other country is because at the end, it's the cutting. Uh. Like uh, the, the, the technology that has involved you know, they have a special machine that cut it. And whereas, they use the old style. In Burma, they polish it using the bicycle wheel, you know. They, 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 do like, they don't have like a motor, they don't use a motorized wheel. Outside the Mandalay, they actually use bicycle power. They do it like this, and then they polish the stone. So when that happens, the polish is not so even. Uh, that is talking about workmanship. Uh, in terms of the quality of st uh, stone, actually, it do play a part uh, from where it's from, especially for gemstones. Like, for example, the Kashmir Sapphire. Those of you who are here uh, at home, you can actually go to Google on Kashmir Sapphires. You will see that the, the Sapphires looks a little bit different from the norm, normal Sapphires from other parts of the world because of certain characteristics. So, uh, it's a very uh, deep question, actually, to say, is it better from there or from what? But in the early parts, uh, many salespeople were taught to say it from Africa. Because easier to talk about. And because Africa was actually the country that uh, gave the world a big supply of diamonds. Previously, before Africa, there's not much supply. Uh, coming from uh, uh, Brazil and India, there was not very big supply. And mostly the big supply of white diamonds. Mostly the time the diamonds was a bit off yellow, uh, yellow color. And uh, if you go and look at the European side, uh, you can see a lot of the, the stones were yellowish. But after Africa came into the market, you start to see more of the white color diamonds. So therefore, it actually made a name to everybody say, hey, African diamond, you want the white color, the more transparent, the more white one. Yeah. 
I, I think there's also uh, some component where there's marketing la, involved, right? Yes. Besides the fact that, uh, like say, the Kashmir stones are, have a signature that makes it more attractive than yes. others from yes. other parts of the world. But I think Africa, besides the white diamond, there's also the, the marketing, la, the selling of African diamonds. Yes. Uh, I think definitely has played, played a part, more so than Kalimantan diamonds. Yes. Right? No, no one is trying to sell Kalimantan diamonds to the world, right? Mostly it's a local market. Yeah. yeah, I've been uh, I've been to Bandung. I went to Bandung and then there was like, this uh, place that's selling the Kalimantan diamonds. You know, uh, my father been to Mandapura and uh, actually the diamonds are really depending on the cutting. You know, if, if you can cut it really well, uh, the diamonds spark because the key thing for diamonds is the sparkle. You know, and this is only brought out through the cutting of the stone. So, yeah, no, nobody is like promoting them internationally. Number, it's also because of the supply. Not enough to go around, la, you know. So, yeah, it's because of the supply, not just because of the no, not enough marketing. Yeah. Okay, the next question, quite interesting. Eh? This one may be a bit technical and a bit fantastic. Uh, is there evidence that Moldavite is a gemstone of extraterrestrial element? It, yes, uh, actually. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my father did a Moldavite uh, research before. Uh, you can go to our website, gemlab.com.sg. There's a paper on Moldavite. Moldavite is actually a byproduct of a meteorite uh, strike. Uh, you can actually find it a lot in Czech, uh, Czech, Czechoslo uh, Czech Republic. Uh, and uh, it's a kind of green color, kind of natural glass. We actually did a whole uh, webinar on this. You can find us on the YouTube channel on the GEM Museum. And uh, it, you can look at it and the whole texture of the whole stone, it differs from uh, even the imitation. Yeah, because for example, you can see the swirl marks, okay, violent swirl marks, which were because when the stone comes back into our atmosphere, it actually hardens and solidifies and therefore causes some kind of inclusions that you don't really see uh, in uh, glass that is made. Yeah, so my father actually documented this and uh, yeah, you can have a look. I, actually, I just googled Moldavite. Uh, yeah, it's quite strange looking, uh, some of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it looks quite organic and... Uh, it looks like alien, alien. Yeah, yeah, like straight out of Superman or something. Yeah, but it's very beautiful, very expensive. Some of this glass, oh. uh, as, uh, that, that's one of the things, when it's above like 20 grams, uh, become very rare. And then uh, it, it looks out of this world. You all can really see it. Yeah. I think whoever asked this question confirmed a gemstone person also. Yeah, yeah, must be. Yeah, must be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good, good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, one last question. Eh? Yeah. A lab-grown diamond has the same qualities as a genuine natural diamond. Yes. Actually. Uh, you and you can call it a fake. Can you call a lab-grown diamond a fake? Okay, the term fake is very ambiguous. Uh -huh. Because uh, fake is like imitation. I can say uh, it's an imitation of something. Yeah. Yeah. So fake must have a. What are you comparing it with? If you're comparing it with diamond, okay, uh, it's a very. Maybe it's not the right term to use. Mm. Because the best is natural diamond, which is made in the ground. My friend will say below ground. And then above ground is a synthetic diamond, which is uh, made in the lab. Yeah, so that is the differentiation because fake and real, these terms are very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because a stone can be natural but treated or synthetic and treated, that, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. But once you mix them up, there's there's no difference, lah. Right. Uh, one you is made in lab. One yeah, lah. But once you mix the two up, you you can't tell the difference, right? Visually, lah. Yeah. Chemically the same, but structurally different. Structurally different. Yeah. If you actually do a very strong UV and you, you shine it, and then you, you use a microscope, you zoom it out 50 times, the growth structure is different. Oh, it's okay. a more of a cubic structure. Whereas the, the what do you call it, uh, the natural diamond is a different structure. It's more like octahedral, the way it's growing, the okay. crystal. I see. Yeah. Okay, that, that's more science. Uh, uh, very science. Uh, very science. Uh, very, very science. Uh. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, we have no more questions uh, from the audience. Let me check. Uh. Okay. I think we can conclude this session today. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us in this uh, hybrid lecture slash workshop. Uh, thank you, Kuming, for sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. Um, for those of you who are here and, and those at home, if you've not come and seen the Orang Banja Special Exhibition, please come to the Malay Heritage Centre. The Special Exhibition is ongoing until July this year. 
right? Um, we will have one more lecture uh, that is aligned with the uh, special exhibition on the 27th of February. Uh, Dr. Imran Tajuddin from NUS uh, Department of Architecture will be joining us and he'll be sharing a bit about uh, the kind of real estate, properties and neighbourhoods that were owned by the Banja community once wow. upon a time. This, and this information has, is new research, it hasn't wow. been shared uh, before and uh, we hope you can join us for the next, uh, next session. All right. Uh, thank you again, Kunming. Thank you, Gem Museum. Uh, before I go, I have one more thing. So this is our QR code for feedback. Uh, your feedback is very important to us. Uh, do share your feedback with us. Uh, it will help us uh, improve our, uh, our programs and also hopefully uh, keep our budget for all the lectures. Because <laughs> we're not selling gemstones. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and nothing else. Uh, thank you again. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and enjoy your weekend.